will be talking about uh, uh, a combination of two papers uh, uh, where possible. Thank you so much. Uh, both of them written with uh, Sasha Kohlenberg, uh, the uh, co-author. And will be about uh, emission trading system, these strategic and dynamic aspects related to uh, the markets, and in particular, some insights related to the market uh, stability uh, reserve. So um, I assume that most of you know the very basic uh, working uh, of an ETS, uh, but I would like to re-emphasize a few aspects uh, that are connected to this particular program uh, um, of uh, research. And uh, the most important aspect is that if you look around, uh, considering uh, most existing or, or proposed uh, ETSs, those are, tend to be single-order policies. Single-order policies mean that you just have a cap. An absolute cap can be sometimes a, a, a relative uh, cap, but there are no elements that provide some flexibility. And as we heard this very morning, already in the 76, Robert and Spence were suggesting that, well, if you truly want to have a or want to approach a first best type of policy, you need to take into account a lot of contingency, a lot of uh, elements. Now, there are already in the current existing uh, ETSs uh, provisions that allow you to um, take into account uh, uh, shocks, changes in the, uh, in the uh, economy, if you like, but those are truly provisions that deal with the temporary shocks. So banking and borrowing provisions, the fact that you, you are not allocating everything at the very beginning upfront, but you, you did, uh, slice and dice uh, the uh, allowances uh, in uh, regular auctions. So there are aspects related to um, shocks that are not entirely integrated in single order policies, and those are permanent shocks. What permanent shocks come from and what is the relevance of that? Well, permanent shocks affect any type of policies, definitely not just climate change policies. They might be related to business cycles, maybe related to uh, new technology that come online and completely change the status quo, or even changes in the existing overlapping uh, policies. So all these speaks directly to the very need of uh, policy adjustment. So you want to have a possibility to reform the program. And we can look at this through the lens, through the prism of the EU ETS, whereby we have a fixed, rigid, a fixed cap, a rigid allocation program, uh, combined with a situation where we have a double economic recession, a very aggress aggressive promotion of renewables, and the incapacity of reflect, of respond to it. And obviously that was, as by design, reflected into reduction of prices, and an uptake of banking that is not sufficient enough to push prices up. And this was considered to be not good in terms of not sending the correct signal to uh, the market. So uh, the debate here that initiated was, okay, what can we do? What type of reform do we need in order to uh, uh, have a system that is sufficiently responsive? So uh, there's not much... Uh, um, new uh, debates, uh, because again, we can go all the way back to the 76. There has been a lot of research on policies that are designed in a way to integrate a particular type of economic dimension, maybe useful to ex post uh, improve the efficiency. So um, uh, in fact, the very Danny Ellerman writing on indexing rules. So you index the policy, you index the cap, on a particular indicator, very difficult to identify the indicator. Newell and Pizer say that. You might, you might try to find the best indicator, but it's always very difficult to find something that precisely mimic uh, reality. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, research on, <clears throat> sorry, on hybrid systems, so mix of uh, cap and trade plus a tax plus a subsidy. And Robert Spence is exactly the very first paper that speaks directly to this uh, type of uh, research. What we're trying to do here in these uh, two papers, uh, we're trying actually to tie together this different uh, uh, literature. Literature on responsive instruments, literature on how you could uh, change the supply, control the supply of allowances, and in doing that, how you can mimic or represent or span the entire uh, spectrum of uh, pure quantity and pure uh, uh, price instruments. So, the debate of, uh, of uh, how to construct and what are the benefits of having hybrid uh, systems. So 
this also had um, um, implication, I believe, for the uh, discussion of the EU ETS reform. Just to briefly mention, the initial debate was, well, we can very, it, it's going to be very difficult to modify the directive. So what we can start thinking about is backloading allowances. So simply, basically, try to re remove uh, what is supposed to be the excess in allowances. But eventually, um, what has been decided and currently implemented is the market stability reserve. Market stability reserve that function pretty much like backloading, but is much more dynamic. So permits are not allocated in the future, put into a reserve, and in the original uh, design, in the original design, the MSR was supposed to be cap preserving. So <laughs> permits were just, the supply was just shifted uh, into the future. At the moment, uh, the MSR, has been reformed itself and has a possibility of permanent cancellation of permit depending on some contingency. Uh, we can discuss that later if you are interested. So what we're trying to do really here is trying to contribute to the academic uh, uh, debate about, well, how you can design a, a policy that is not necessarily a full-fledged um, hybrid system, so still relatively simple to implement, and how these but the, this very research has been, in a way, or used to uh, provide some sort of underpinning for some of the parameters uh, that are relevant for the MSR, in particular the adjustment uh, parameter, the rate, the intensity of the adjustment of the uh, supply. Okay, so uh, a bit of words about the general setup. So we, um, the, the major uh, aspect that we model are the dimensions that are considered by the, um, the, 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 uh, by the companies as determinant of their decision, meaning current and future uh, cost of reducing emissions, that obviously is a part of the decision process. The existing back, the number of permits they uh, currently have, obviously, if you start from very, the very instant uh, of the beginning of the entire ETS, the bank is uh, starting from zero. Uh, and then the future expectation about demand, of allowances, meaning uh, um, the, the demand itself, and the allocation, the supply of allowances. So what you will see here, uh, because of interest of time, I will uh, concentrate the attention on one particular parameter that should, be, should help me explain what, what is the, the contribution. That parameter, that model parameter is R, capital RT. This is the difference between counterfactual emission, what you will emit in the absence of uh, uh, a policy and the number of allowances that uh, you get allocated. So, spoiler alert. So, what is important? Why this RT is important? Well, if you consider the entire spectrum of all the policy, if you have a situation where you have a fixed cap, so a, um, no response whatsoever, the old shocks, anything that is happening in the economy, or in the technology, or in the policy, is automatically transferred, reflected into RT. And if you go all the way to a fully floating cap, meaning a fully responsive policy, or every type of um, uh, shock is completely absorbed by the, uh, by the mechanism itself, so by the policy itself, so RT stay fixed. So um, the uh, elements, the ingredients of the models are listed here. So we are modeling the bank, because bank will be the index of our uh, policy. B0 is the initial bank. A, uh, capital A is the amount of permits you receive, the, su the supply. Obviously, here we're considering period T, so this is how much you received. ETE, capital E, is how much you emitted from zero to T. And alpha and beta represent the two strategies, how much you actually can abate and how much you uh, want to trade, buy uh, and sell. And here I'm not taking into account complexity like uh, uh, the penalty, so what we are imposing is that at the very last period, capital T of the horizon, we have a finite horizon in the extension of the paper. In the second paper, we have an infinite horizon. In the finite horizon, the bank has to be zero, so meaning full compliance. We are obliging, forcing the system to be in full compliance. Okay, so RT, why RT is important? RT is what determines the strategy, what drives the strategy of the company. And RT is, at time T, the expectation of what you will receive, the expectation of what you will emit, so between now and the future, and what you have in the bank at the moment. And this BT take into account past. So everything is already in here. Why is this relevant? Because changes in the expectation of this expected required abatement 
will change how much you want to abate and how much you want uh, to trade. Okay, so what is the problem we are trying to solve here? Uh, this is the minimization, the, the program, the minimization program from the perspective of the, of the company. We have the two elements, the first two components describe the total cost of um, uh, abating. The second two components uh, describe the total cost of trading. So, uh, pi t and rho are intercept and slope of the marginal cost curve, and p t minus 2 nu beta uh, are, represent the linear marginal uh, trading cost. So, in a way, we're taking into account also what will be the cost of, uh, of trading. This is obviously important at the company level. You will see when we'll, we will optimize the entire policy, uh, we will we not consider trading because in aggregate trading nets out what the, the amount of the company buys is equivalent to the amount the companies uh, sell. Okay, so we solved the problem. We tried to look at what is exactly is, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the key variable that we want to uh, use to describe abatement and price. And what we obtain is that alpha. Alpha is the strategy, the aggregate abatement uh, at, uh, at time t in equilibrium. Now notice there are two components. The first component represent what you would do unconditionally. So unconditionally, you know how much you expect in terms of uh, demand, how much you expect in terms of supply, and basically you smooth out the, the, your requirement abatement between now and the remaining time. Uh, there is a parameter delta, uh, I will explain in a, in a second. The delta is the adjustment rate, uh, the, 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 the new policy that we are introducing. I'll show you in a second how that uh, uh, enters, what is the exact mechanism at the moment. Just keep in mind, this is affecting the way I will unconditionally change my uh, abatement uh, strategy, and that DC represents the changes in the expectation. So at every instant, I'm changing my expectation. Every instant, I, have, I gather more information about my abatement, future abatement cost, I gather more information about my demand, gather more information about my supply, and I change, I adapt my abatement uh, strategies. So DC incorporates the shocks, and the cap adjustment, shock in the economy, cap adjustment in a way, another type of shock, if you like, coming through uh, the mechanism, although it's a rule-based mechanism, and also capture itself, the response of the companies uh, uh, to that uh, particular uh, uh, adjustment. So this is the mechanism I was describing. Resemble the MSR, not quite exactly the MSR. We wanted to abstract from the nitty gritty of a certain um, uh, threshold, and I'll explain to you in a second why. So that delta is the intensity of the adjustment, and the delta, the adjustment, the total amount of adjustment depends on the bank level BT, and in particular, how far BT is from a, a target C. Now, for the uh, for, for, uh, in order to ex express uh, the rationale, think about C as a strict positive number, but in the long run, it will ma ma make ma much more sense to think about C as zero, because you want to go all the way to bank equal, uh, equal zero. But at the moment, think just about C as a positive number, and you're constraining, in a way, the bank to be around a certain, a certain interval. So if you have if a delta, is uh, very high, is the intensity of the adjustment is very high, naming, uh, namely you see a certain shock and you completely offset, offset, offset the shocks. Uh, what you will have is a floating cap and you constrain deviation of the bank uh, around the uh, target C. So basically you try to offset completely your, uh, whatever is the type of shocks you observe, you offset that by adjusting the allocation and the bank is kept tight within a certain uh, bounds. If there is no adjustment whatsoever, so you have a fixed cap, so one extreme and the other, a, a, a fixed cap corresponds to a quantity instrument, pure quantity, floating cap, a perfect floating cap corresponds to a, a, a tax. In that particular case, bank moves, moves around, and uh, the, the larger are the fluctuation, uh, the, sorry, the larger, uh, the lower is the adjustment rate, the larger are the fluctuation. From an illustration point of view, this is what you observe. Left hand side, switch off the adjustment mechanism, bank goes wherever, blue line represents like a median uh, uh, simulation, and on, the, uh, on your right hand side, you see something where this MSR, oh, sorry, the adjustment um, 
uh, mechanism is switched on and constraints, you control in a way the bank level. Obviously, this is an intervention. And the, the way it's intervening is exactly by changing this FT, is the program of allocation, the uh, uh, pre-adjustment uh, uh, program, and the second component, consider the uh, adjustment itself. Okay, now, we have all the uh, inputs, we know how companies respond, what we try to do is identify what is the optimal adjustment rate. So, what should be the intensity of the adjustment? And initially we thought, well, you might think that you want to have a fully responsive uh, uh, policy. Well, it's not necessarily the case. And I'll show you uh, why this is not the case. So here, we, can comp we take the aggregate costs, so aggregate uh, contract cost, aggregate trading cost, aggregate trading cost net to zero because uh, it's just internal uh, trading among the companies. So the uh, assumption that we have, uh, we have here is that at the moment we are considering this, uh, and I think it's relatively innocuous, we are considering the situation where all companies have exactly the same initial bank B0 and the firms have the same emission process. So there is an underlying process that control uh, uh, emissions. So we could extend that and have the results in distribution, but at the moment, not really useful to understand what, what is the intuition behind this uh, delta. So once we solve this problem, what we obtain is we can rewrite the aggregate compliance cost as the sum of three different components. What is very interesting is that you are able, by looking at these different three components, you're able to identify a trade-off. So there is a trade-off between implementing a pure uh, uh, quantity instrument or a pure uh, price instrument. Somewhere in between, you will identify a sweet spot. And that sweet spot, that trade-off, comes from the fact that you are weighing out adjustment cost versus intertemporal cost saving. So the, the fact that you're moving completely to a situation, a scenario where you are completely offsetting shocks means that you are removing all the decision from the companies. Company cannot decide much in terms of uh, abating or trading. So they are not intertemporally doing anything. So they are not uh, exploiting the situation where prices can differ uh, between today and the future. Okay, so, uh, that's just repeating basically what I, what I said. The trade-off is between firms' cost saving caused by the shock mitigating effect and the firms' loss uh, of benefit uh, from exploiting the differences in, uh, in prices. Now, uh, we wanted also to say something about uh, perception of risk. In a way, connect these analyses also to um, more clearly connect these analyses to the uh, spectrum of a uh, pure tax, pure uh, uh, cap and trade. So what we looked into is the perceived riskiness of any type of investment that in a way is a proxy or opposite. You can look at uh, the dynamics of the prices of permits as a proxy of the uh, uh, investment value. And we look at how the adjustment, how a, a, a supply control affects the perceived uh, riskiness of the, uh, of the investment. So here what we have is, if you have a fully floating cap, so the cap is completely offsetting all the type of shocks that you see uh, in, the, in the system, what you will have, as I said, is RT, the expected risk, uh, the expected required abatement, is fixed. Is it, if this is fixed, means that you know exactly how much you need to do to get to a certain uh, point in terms of uh, total reduction. That means that respect to the usual cost of financing your investment, you're not charging any extra premium. There's no extra riskiness associated to doing more or doing less and not knowing exactly how much you need to do by capital, capital T. On the opposite, if you have a pure uh, quantity instrument, a pure cap and trade, well, you know that prices reflect variability in the economic variables, meaning that reflects variability in RT, and that means that on top of the uh, return that you will demand for investment, you charge a, a, a premium, QT. Just to show you some, uh, an illustration that illustrates again this point, we're moving from top corner where we have a delta equals zero, no adjustment whatsoever. So the price, so you have an aggregate cost on the y-axis, aggregate cost move around, okay, this axis. And then the more you move from here, sorry, from here 
towards zero, you're moving from a situation where you are increasing the responsiveness, you're increasing the uh, delta. And you're moving to a situation where delta is equal one, basically perfect responsiveness. When you move to delta equal one, what you observe is risk premiums decreases and the price, the aggregate price is flat, meaning a tax, right? It's a tax. So we are again able to represent the U shape of reducing aggregate cost. So costs are reducing, but then at some point increase again. So there is still the, you, you, you see evidently the illustration of these uh, trade uh, costs. Okay, to conclude, this is just a, a, a list of the points I just discussed. So to conclude, uh, what, what we're do, doing here. So we realized back in 2012 that most existing ETSs uh, lack provisions of responsiveness, lack provision to address persistent shocks. They do have provision to address temporary shocks like banking and borrowing, but not persistent shocks. So the debate was, what can we do? What is the type of reform? What is the type of policy that we can implement to make the system responsive? And the type of um, mechanism that we've been investigating here is something that adjusts the stringency of the policy, so the cap itself. And what we observe is that permits can change and will be changed in response to the uh, shock of a particular index that in, the, in this very uh, paper is, uh, is the bank, but could have been a different, uh, a different index. Obviously, you need to model it differently. And in doing that, we span the entire spectrum of the uh, price quantity uh, uh, um, uh, instruments. So we can move all the way from a pure um, uh, price instrument to a pure uh, quantity instrument. And we are also able to provide an underpinning for the adjustment, for the optimal adjustment rate, for this intensity of adjustment, by identifying this trade-off between doing something, company do something, and there is no response in the, uh, uh, in the system. So this is the pure quantity instruments. And a situation where actually all the heavy lifting is done by the responsiveness in the policy, but companies cannot exploit the differences in uh, 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 intertemporal trading. So these intertemporal trading things out, meaning fixed price. There's no intertemporal trade, basically. And also, we connect these, or we try to connect these to the expected uh, uh, risk premium, so the expected risk on investment, to showcase how this uh, span is exactly moving from pricing moving all over the place and fixed price. So quantity instruments and uh, price instruments. Okay, with that, I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to questions.